Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Tim Early, and we're going to be speaking about what it's like to be a high myope and the genetics of myopia on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Uh, I am super, super stoked to uh, to be joined by Tim Early. Can you share with us a little bit about your practice and uh, where you live and so forth? Absolutely. And Dave, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's it's an honor to be on Dave Kading's Myopia Podcast. <laughs> Greatly appreciate the, the time and, and uh, getting me on. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been in practice now for about 24 years in a town called Medina, Ohio. We're about a half hour south of Cleveland. Uh, and the community is pretty much a bedroom community for Cleveland. A lot of folks sure. raise their families in Medina. And uh, especially pre-COVID, you know, we're, we're working in both Akron and Cleveland. So a lot of young families, a lot of smart people, a lot of people who are uh, uh, myopic, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so we really um, have been dealing for years uh, with with families. I got thinking about like the things that you know we're passionate about in optometry. Oftentimes, there's a personal story behind, you know, why that's something we're passionate about. So, just a quick history on me: I was I was the son of two myopic parents that uh, ended up being about a minus eight prior to having refractive surgery uh, back in '98. And thinking about like myopia control, just the history of it, I was the kid in third grade who had flat top bifocals because my optometrist back in the day, you know, back in the 80s, was attempting myopia control by prescribing uh, flat top bifocals for kids who were rapidly progressing. So I got thinking about that, you know, and it's interesting. This is a, a problem that we've been dealing with in optometry for a very long time that I think it's just so refreshing uh, to now have a better solution or better answers, better treatments for. So yeah, I, 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 when you asked me to be on the podcast, I got thinking about, hey, you know, myopia has been something that's been a big part of most of my life, my, uh, my adult life and professional life for sure, but it goes back to my childhood. And uh, my lovely wife and I met in optometry school, my lovely minus six myope wife, and guess what, Dave? We bred and had kids. And guess what? They have myopia too. <laughs> so yeah. I look at yeah. the, uh, we, we, we were prepared, you know, but we didn't have a whole lot of tools, even as recently as, you know, the early to mid 2000s, uh, even a decade ago, we we're still kind of muddling our way through. But we did pick up on uh, orthokeratology uh, back in 2007, 2008, and started as a practice you know, proactively fitting kids in, in, uh, we use a lot of the Paragon CRTs, uh, back in the day. And two of my three children did wear those for a significant uh, amount of time. But so, yeah, that's kind of like my background. I, I, I really got into my open control mostly because it's something that I was, I think, preparing and, and, and watching out for in my own children. And I like the fact now that the standard of care is changing. We're at a point now where uh, as optometrists, we are starting to have that conversation when kids are, you know, minus a half or minus 75 instead of waiting until they're minus two, three, four, five before we, you know, we do something about it. So, yeah, yeah. that's, um, that's a really kind of an interesting uh, uh, history with you having been so myopic. You know, I think one of the concerns that I have for many practitioners out there is they might be a minus one, minus two. And right. so myopia isn't that that big of a deal, and uh, they don't get their heads around what it's like to be a minus eight, uh, you know. And, and and it seems to be this perception of once somebody is over a minus three, it doesn't really matter what the refractive error is. They have to wear glasses for everything. And maybe you can speak to that. Like, is is that true, or is is it like way worse to be a minus six and a minus eight? Well, it's funny how it, the, the, the very words you just stated, I said to a patient earlier today in clinic. And, uh, you know, I was just, you know, this gentleman, uh, college age, you know, considering refractive surgery, it's a minus four, minus 450. And, and he said, you know, oh, my, my, my eyes are so much better than my dad's. You know, he's a minus seven. And I said, well, 
realistically, to your point, once you get over a certain point, you just can't see, you know, everything from, you know, arm's length and further is, is blurry. So it's, it's a matter of more than just the refractive error. It's a matter of, you know, what's that going to do for the health of the eye the rest of your life? And um, I think that's the message I think that we're really trying to, 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 to kind of, you know, get across to parents, especially, is that this is not just a refractive issue. You know, yes, it's a refractive issue. And most parents of kids um, who are heading down that same path have been there too, in, in my experience. Um, the trickier ones are the parent who is relatively emotropic sitting in your chair. And I find a lot of power in just taking out my trial lens and saying, you know, I'll put a plus five over them and say, hey, listen, this is what your child sees at distance. You know, this mm -hmm. is not comfortable. Um, if your child wants to play sports, your child wants to drive someday, you know, I'd rather them be uh, way, way less myopic. And also we're going to make sure that we don't have this axial length change. It's going to potentially lead to some of the, the retinal problems that can be a problem in adulthood. So yeah, to speak directly from that, you know, when I got to be a minus eight, that was after optometry school. Um, I progressed pretty rapidly through my, my childhood. And, and even uh, despite my flat top 28 bifocals, uh, the family history was just too strong, Dave. It, it was too little, too late. I, I, I kept progressing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, hopefully the research continues to progress that as we yeah. see people with high refractive corrections, what can we do to, you know, slow the genetics down uh, to some degree? And we know that plays a part in some way. We're still struggling to find, you know, the genes that really point to it, yeah. but the risk of uh, having uh, myopia, if you've got, you know, two parents is, you know, six times more likely. And if you've got one parent, it's three times more likely. And uh, so, so definitely there's something with genetic, but it seems to be that, uh, you know, two factors influence the uh, volume and the height of the myopia that you're going to have is that what age you get it and your amount of time outside plays a big part into that. But in your case, you know, growing up like uh, you and I did, and you're a little bit older than I did, we spent all times outside, right? We were outside a lot. We didn't have the screens like kids do today, but even yeah. so you developed into a minus eight. Uh, What's interesting, you, that's, you, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, I'm sorry, Dave. Yeah. I was gonna ask, how do you talk with parents about that? How do you communicate with them in, in that vein? Yeah, you know, I, and I'm glad you brought up the, it's, it's a multifactorial condition. It's probably the best way to put it, you know? And I, I feel like to your point, I grew up on a farm and, you know, we had <laughs> beef cows. You lived and, outside. Yeah. 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 Well, we were fixing fences had an orchard. My dad was a beekeeper. Um, so I lived outdoors. Yeah, my dad, uh, his profession was, he was a building contractor. My first job was on job sites, building houses, um, no screen time whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you, you have a really interesting point there. You know, we look at the genetics behind other prominent, you know, pathologies in eye care, whether it's AMD or, you know, in diabetes, for example, glaucoma, you know, and we're starting to figure some of that stuff out now with keratoconus, for example, you know, we've got some gene testing being done now for, for cones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to your knowledge, are there currently um, studies that we're enrolling folks in looking at the, the genetics behind myopia? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, privy to any of those studies that are being done. I think what they're by and large trying to do is they're looking at the, you know, the genetic map that's out there and they're looking for what really points to it. And, okay. um, from, from my understanding and talking to people that far, know far more about myopia and myopia research than I do is we're not satisfied with what we found to be definitive yet. It seems okay. as if so many myopic parents have myopia and what they're claiming at this point is we tend to do things that cause myopia like our parents did, which caused their myopia. But everybody knows there's something that's even more definitive than what we're fully aware of yet. Yes, and you can if even speak, sense. you know, in, in our own families, you know, I'm one of four children and um, I won the prize for the worst eyes. You know, I had the worst myopia. But meanwhile, my, my younger sister might've been a minus one when all was said and done. You know, grow up in the same home, same parents. You know, of course, there's some differences in DNA there, of course. But, you know, 
we were avid readers. You know, that was something that, you know, we, that's how we spent our free time. We lived so far out in the country, Dave, we didn't have cable. We barely uh-huh. got the three networks. So like it was uh-huh. evenings we're sitting around reading kind of thing. But, you yeah. know, you asked a question before and it, it's a good one. How do you talk to parents today? Um, we can reminisce about the old days and no screens and no cell phones and things, but Not I'm sure you've had the same experience I've had. You know, I, I'll see a, a parent in the office and their, their two-year-old child is, you know, in a stroller across the room with the mother's cell phone, you know, playing a game. So they're starting mm-hmm. out really young, you know, kind of behind the proverbial eight ball when it comes to myopic risk. Uh, so, yeah, I think that discussion and how we have that discussion with parents is, is important, but also it's critical. Um, and you reference something that I reference every day in practice. It's listen, you need to get your, your child, you know, finding something that they enjoy outdoors. Yeah. And I usually use the two hour rule, you know, two hours a day, if they get a half hour at school with recess, there should be another 90 minutes of outdoor time at some point during the rest of their day. And it, it's tough in Ohio in the winter when it's cold and miserable, but um, for a lot of kids, that's going to be, you know, take up, you know, gymnastics, um, basketball, even if you're indoors and looking at distance, it's way better than being in front of a screen or playing games or, or gaming. Um, and there's nothing wrong with those activities. I, and that, that's the, the nuance. You can't, we're, we're all going to be on devices. That is, that is the way our, our lives operate and uh, coming across in a non-judgmental way, but also making it real clear that that is a risk factor. Um, that we're seeing a, a much greater prevalence of yeah. myopia in countries where we spend a lot of time on a screen. Yeah. That, that is so true. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, th- th- there's an aspect of recommending outdoor time that we tend to separate and say, that means no screen time. And I think that even yeah. amongst that, sharing with parents the value of the outdoor time for being outdoor not for necessarily stressing the activity that you do outdoors, because for many of us, that means that, well, we have a small backyard or we live in an apartment or, you know, where, what are we going to do for outdoors? And the parents are, you know, working from home and they tend to, you know, they, they, they yeah. tend to not necessarily. So, so one of the things I, I, you know, think we should be promoting more and more is if your kid is going to be on the screen, tell them to go do it outdoors. Um, and yes, we want to get them yeah. away from the screen, but the value of being outdoors doesn't necessarily just seem to be tied to the far away distance that people are yeah. looking. It's more than that. It's the vitamins that we're getting for the sun. And yes, it tends to promote being outdoors, yeah. but I can tell you that if I sent one of my daughters outside to play on her uh, on a device or something, you know, within about 10 to 15 minutes, she'd be off running with one of the other girls right. just because they, they, they do that, right? They, they bring each it's other brilliant. in and they yeah. go on the swing or whatever. I have this classic picture of something that, you know, we did last summer and uh, the girls were playing Legos and I'm like, take it outside to the, to the yeah. table outside. And they were outside playing Legos, right? So just getting them outside and you know, in, in Seattle, they've got these, you know, outdoor, uh, outdoor preschools that meet during, you know, all the school year and the kids never go inside in these preschools. They, wow. so they have to get good rain gear and, uh, and they just <laughs> stay outside. It's just this incredible thing. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I froze my nose and my toes a lot growing up in South Dakota in Ohio, you, uh, you've dealt with the same sort of thing, but there's yeah. something about being cold that, uh, maybe we need to get our kids out and doing those things again. Right. You know, it's, yeah, you're right. You know, and I'm going to steal that too. That's, that's not a perspective on the outdoor time that I've ever shared mm-hmm. with patients. So that's brilliant. Um, I'll definitely use that. Uh, but you're right. I know that, um, I think we become creatures that seek comfort, whether that's, yeah. you know, you know, heat, you know, a, a temperature of 70 to 74 degrees or whatever. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm not sure, you know, growing up where it was cold, like you learn to accept that that's, that was normal as a kid, but having those outdoor activities where we're, we skied a lot um, cross country and downhill. And um, I know I have a good friend, an, an OD out in Minnesota and uh, they sh- uh, snowshoe. So I think you can get creative. I think part of it is that and as a parent, I can say this because I'm guilty of this as well. It, it's easy 
to give a kid a screen and have that become yep. a babysitter. You know, no, it is. Um, I think it's more difficult to find ways to engage your children. And I think you're spot on with the, uh, I would send our kids outside with sidewalk chalk on our driveway. And then before you know it, they're in the woods and they're, they're digging holes and they're getting dirty and there's value in that, you know, the, just that kind of play versus something that's always digital or always a screen. But yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's it. I like the way you said that. I think, I, I guess I, I don't know that many of our colleagues realize that Dave, that it's the, actually the act of being outdoors versus what you're doing out there. That's a, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Well, well, there is value to far away vision. And, uh, you know, we, we, we define this as the 2022 rule with the two being the outdoor time. And yeah. uh, so it, we, we do want them looking far away, but it appears, you know, even from the research that it is, it, it is more than just the far away distance vision. Um, but it seems to have, you know, that big ball in the sky was put there for a reason. And it does more for us with the, with dopamine and other neurotransmitters and, and, and so forth that we come in contact with. So, you know, go, getting back to this, uh, talking with parents, you know, how, how do you work with them in, um, in sharing with them the perspective to, to get them to move forward in a myopia management type of, uh, type of protocol, what are you yeah. doing right now in uh, in practice? You had mentioned ortho K early on, and and so forth. Yeah, so we we developed, and I'm going to thank off the top here, uh, Dr. Andrew Pucker um, mm -hmm. was brilliant. Uh, he got me started with a myopia control program in our practice going back maybe six seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer, an actual program as opposed to just doing ortho K. Um, and what we did there is that was around the time you're we getting better information about the value of atropine and the concentration that was most effective. And uh, we were also just getting our hands on some uh, center distance design, multifocal contact lenses. So the way we present it now um, is, listen, there are three different ways that we can approach myopia management through our practice. And we have a, a, a packet, a really well done packet that goes over those three options. Um, and essentially, we, we update it based on the most recent information, uh, clinical information, scientific data, you know, looking at whether it's a 60 to 70% reduction in overall myopic progression over the course of the therapy. You know, we kind of give the parents, you know, what those options are. And oftentimes, depending on the child's age, what parents tend to lean towards is the most passive, which is the atropine therapy. Um, I'd say probably more than half our patients are on atropine therapy. Um, hmm those children who are able to handle contact lenses, the responsibilities that come with it, and parents are, who are okay with their children wearing uh, a contact lens, uh, of course, we explore those options as well. We've had quite a few who graduated from atropine into ortho -K or into contact lenses over the years. They start out with, with atropine, and then as time goes by, uh, depending on what they're doing in school and things, sometimes they find, for example, with the uh, the CRT, the Paragon lens, not having to deal with a drop or contact lenses during waking hours is great. They just do their overnight yeah. wear and then they, it, it just simplifies. We see a lot of that with the athletes who just don't want to be bothered by even a soft contact lens when they're playing their sports. Yeah. Um, and that conversation as, as, a, as a parent of kids who did myopia management, do, do you use that helps? Do you find that that helps you in the, in the conversation? So Dave, that helps with everything. Um, I wear a, a soft multifocal contact lens now, post LASIK, I'm an emetrope. And just being honest with patients about the realities of presbyopia. And by the way, buddy, you'll get there. Um, it, it just, I'm gonna give you the lens I wear and I don't get much pushback. It's the same thing with myopia management. It's the same thing with recommending nutraceuticals. My mom has AMD, for example. I take a, a high quality you know, a supplement for my macula. So I think anything that we have experience with and that's what got me reflecting about this topic. It's like, how, how did I get into my opioid management? And when I really thought about it, it's, it's something that's been near and dear to me for a long time. And it's something that's yeah. affected my family and my children. So yeah, I think it's an yeah. easy conversation to have with folks who've been myopic parents. It's a more difficult conversation with someone who's never dealt with, with um, that condition themselves, myopia. So I think demonstrating yeah. and not talking too much is, is the way to, to sell the parent on the value, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. 
Well, I appreciate your perspectives. Uh, you know, I, I can't believe we've been chatting this long. It's 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 uh, it's just interesting to talk with other people who have uh, perspectives around myopia, how they're treating them, how they got into it. You know, being a high myop yourself and and having kids within it. Uh, it's been awesome to chat with you. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. And I want you to know, like, this is kind of cool that this is the first time we've officially talked to each other. I know. It's like I, I know, know you, buddy. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah, that's the thing about the podcast, right? So, and thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Please stay tuned for uh, future episodes. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next time. Hey, Dave, thanks for having me. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.